Bob Shannon, head of Radio 2, I like very much, and a, a lawyer came in here and uh, said that on the second occasion we met, um, said that uh, they were severing all you know, sort of things with me, actually. And um, I, I mean, I had been asked to resign uh, by uh, Bob Shannon and the BBC, but I, I said, well, why do I want to resign? You know, there's no point. I haven't. I love my job at the BBC. I love the BBC. Why would I resign? So yes. we're, we're going to hear Lord Hall in his own words. Yes. He said, this is so serious, I've sacked him. But you're saying the BBC yes. said, it's so serious, we're going to ask you to resign. Well, they did. They gave me the chance to resign with the, uh, saying that that way you don't actually cut off all ties from the BBC and we could probably bring you back in a few months. Um, I don't think people knew that. But uh, I said, no, I wouldn't do that because... I've got nothing to hide, and I'm, I'm just attacking me for telling the truth. As simple as that. So why would I want to resign from a job that I absolutely adore? Have you heard directly from Lord Hall, the Director General? No, I haven't. No, no not at all. Um, I met him. In fact, he came on a, a programme of mine, funnily enough, a 50th anniversary programme that I did when I was my 50th year of broadcasting, when he came on and thanked me for all he, I'd done for the BBC. When was that? I don't know. It was a little while ago now. Last August, in fact, it would have been, yes. Last August, I think it was. Yeah, I, I, he's a very nice man. I, I thought I was getting on very well with him. <laughs> and I like him very much. There are two accounts. James Jandersmith does not like these two differing accounts. Yes. Do, do you doubt that there were memos written in 1971? No, I'm, I'm sure there were memos written in 1971. Um, but I never saw them. And, and the truth of the matter is that I've seen the memos, but there's nothing to go on with them. And I've said time and time again, can you show me any notes at this meeting that I'm meant to have been at? And they haven't got any, uh, which I find very strange. So really, no, I'm sure that there was memos, and I'm sure that Bill Cotton Jr. wrote, wrote these memos. I have a theory on what happened. OK, well, let me just hear... I've got one here. I've got yes. it here. Look, Tony, have a look. Tony is putting his glasses on. From Assistant Head of Variety Light Entertainment. Yeah. And it says yeah. here... For your note, he was interviewed by Head of Light Entertainment yep. and myself, and as expected, has issued a flat denial. For mm. my part, I must accept the situation, although it would be less than fair if I were not to record that his recollection mm. does not agree with the first thoughts of, I think it means his agent. What I'm actually basically saying, and this I think is what the BBC is slightly upset about, I think I should have been investigated, for God's sake. If, if I'd done something wrong, then I should have been investigated. But unfortunately, I only heard about this in... 2012, I think it was, and the BBC were aware of that, but I never saw these memos. They said you were there, those men in well, this memo. Were you? Sorry, there? I wasn't, no. No, I wasn't there. So how, could I, that, how could it have happened that they said you were? I think in the 70s, my agent, Harold Davison, very, very powerful agent, Harold Davison, he handled Frank Sinatra uh, and me. Uh, I think Frank Sinatra made him a little bit more money. So he was very friendly with Bill Cotton Jr., who was like God here. He's a very powerful man, and the two of them basically, I think, controlled a lot of show business. They were great friends. I think if a complaint might have come in, or did come in, they might have said, oh, just say that you've seen him. And possibly that's what happened there, and they just filed it away. And that, I, I promise you on my life that I never seen saw those memos. So the memo could have been written yes. saying we've seen Tony Blackburn, meaning we haven't seen Tony Blackburn, we've seen people who speak for Tony Blackburn. Yes, exactly. I mean, surely if, I, if something as serious as this had really happened, why was I not taken off Radio 1? Why wasn't I still on Top of the Pops? One time I was taken off, I made a remark about the miners should go back to, to work, and I got taken off for a couple of weeks. Now, I remember that. Of course I did. Well, you and Dame Janet would be on the same side if you thought that the BBC didn't treat this complaint correctly, mm. because she does say that in her report. Let's just listen to a little bit of why your evidence troubles oh. her. I had before me documents, um, contemporaneous documents from 1971, uh, one relating to a conversation that took place between Bill Cotton and A7, the other a conversation relate between Mr. Brian Neal QC, as he then was now the Right Honourable Sir Brian Neal, both of whom said that they had had conversations with A7. A7 told me that no such conversations had taken place and that this was not a lapse of memory on his part. They simply have not taken place. And I rejected that evidence. It, it basically boils down to my word against hers. The, the thing is that... Uh, with all due respect to uh, Dame Janet, she wasn't there. I was in 1971, and I can't lie and say that it happened because it didn't. Somebody, and I don't want to mention the name, suggested that it would have been much better 
if I'd said that it was so far a long time ago, uh, I didn't remember. And because you went to Dame Janet voluntarily. Oh, I, I went to Dame Janet voluntarily, yes. I didn't take anybody with me. I didn't feel as though I had to, because I, I'm not a liar, I just tell the truth. So you could have said, I don't remember, would you have been sacked? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I remember everything that happened with the B at the BBC, and if I'd been reprimanded by anybody at the BBC, of course I'd remember that. And somebody told me if I'd been in with Brian O'Neill, he would have been there, there'd have been somebody taking notes. I did ask Dame Janet, can you tell me where I was meant to have this interview? With Brian O'Neill. With Brian O'Neill, and she couldn't. What we can do, I can read a bit, this is yeah. page... 514 of Janet's misreport. The Savlin in investigation interviewed A7 in 2013. He told us that all he remembers of being called by his agent just before the News of the World article came out to be told that the article was going to be printed and that his name was in Claire McAlpine's diary. Yes, it's, it's a very sad case and um, I remember it very much. Harold Davison rung me up and said there is going to be a, an article in, in the News of the World with this girl Claire McAlpine who I... I didn't, I, I didn't know personally. In fact, in my autobiography, later I do say that some fans you know, used to come round and I remembered her from a picture that I saw in this article and uh, I remembered her from that picture. I thought, well, I know that person. I can't remember the actual thing. Must have come round with friends and asked for an autograph. So Harold Davidson said, this particular story will be going in the news of the world. He said, he, he said don't worry about it, but your name is mentioned in a diary that nobody seems to have seen. And she claims to have slept with people like Frank Sinatra, Rock Hudson, and this incident with me. And he said it's, um, you know, he, they all considered it was a fantasy. It was all investigated by the coroner, the police, and there's no misconduct against me or anything like that. Yep. It also explains that a BBC employee rang Vera, the mother of Claire, yep. to be told that she was withdrawing her complaint. That's yep. also there in the memos. Yes, the, there was a complaint by the mother, which I wish I'd known about in 71, and then it was withdrawn uh, about, I don't know, a week or two later. And uh, the mother, the foster mother, said that uh, she thought that her daughter had not actually uh, told the truth. Do you uh, I mean, it's a, it's a really sad story, but unfortunately, you know, I, I have nothing to do with it. Do you think that there is a whiff of impropriety now out there about your name, even though we're now talking about a complaint that was withdrawn and a meeting that Dame yeah. Janet does not accept your evidence about? Has this left your name tainted. I mean, I don't want to sue the BBC. Uh, I've got no wish to do that, but I do want to get my career back and my reputation back, yes. I think the amount of support I've had has astounded me amongst the public and my friends in the broadcasting media, which absolutely has astounded me on Twitter. You know, I've, I've just read people saying that the BBC has behaved disgracefully. Well, I wonder if you can blame Lord Hall. Let's just listen to what he said. This is one of the most important inquiries in the BBC's history. And that has put an even greater responsibility on everyone who took part in that inquiry to cooperate fully and to be open. So many survivors and witnesses have honestly and openly cooperated fully and at great personal cost to themselves. As Dame Janet has said, she's rejected his evidence, rejected his evidence, and she's explained very clearly why. I have to take that extremely seriously. My interpretation of that is that Tony Blackburn fell short of the standards of evidence that such an inquiry demanded. Well, not up to the standards of the BBC inquiry. I thought I was going along there to tell the truth, which I did. I can only say that I told the truth. Now, it's, I suppose, my word against a judge. I, I've got no idea. The whole thing, to be honest with you, Paddy, baffles me. You go in there in, in front of, um, you know, lawyers and things like that. I was by myself. I told the truth. Now, if that isn't up to the BBC standard, I don't know what he means by that. And surely... He means that there's a document, Tony, yes. from 1971, and it says that two people met you. So he... Yeah. What, can you blame him for, for thinking that there is a discrepancy? Well, I, I can't blame anybody for anything. All I'm saying is that I never saw those documents till 2012. And I wish I had seen them. And I wish it had been investigated properly, because this... We wouldn't be in the mess we are in now. So I am blaming the BBC in 1971... Now, all these people are dead. So I'm not having a go at the management of the BBC now. They seem to be protecting people who are now dead. Now, I am saying that the management of the BBC at the time did fall short of my standards because I should have been investigated. 
I didn't do anything wrong, I hasten to add, but I still should have been investigated if there was a complaint against me. You told The Guardian in 2014 about radio, I can't do anything else. I do really love radio. I've loved it from when I was an early child. Mm. So what kind of state are you in at the moment? Well, I'm just very sad about it, actually, Paddy. I love the BBC. I was proud to work at the BBC. You know, I opened up Radio 1, and I don't understand why this has happened to me, quite honestly. I don't bear any grudge against anybody. I love the people I work with, working at Radio 2, with all the great names that they have there, and it's a great station. That was one of the proudest moments of my life. It took me 30 years to get there, doing a programme like Pick of the Pops, which we put over a million audience on. I thought it was all going rather well. And so this one comment from Dame Janet Smith has ruined it all. And I do object to that. And I'm very, I was very, very, very annoyed about it. But I'm not annoyed now. I'm sad. If the Director General, who I actually rather like, if he came up to me and said, look, we've all made a mistake. It's all gone wrong. Come on back. I'd shake his hand and say thank you. You know, no hard feelings at all. I want to be back where I love being at the BBC. I wonder if you can envisage yourself not being in a radio studio. It seems to me you might be frightened about where you are. Yeah, I mean, I, I do at night time. Um, uh, at night time, I, I sort of basically wake up and I think Saturday I'd normally be doing Pick of the Pops. I've got nowhere to go. And it, to me, it's awful. And I love music. All my shows, I'm... Very lucky I, I actually choose all the music. So half the time at home, I'm choosing music for my shows. And I got home from doing a show on KMFM, who'd been wonderful to me, and um, commercial radio, they're sticking with me, which is terrific. But I go home and I go in the studio, my little studio, and select music for hours on end and listen to new music, and they've taken all that away from me. That, to me, is like life, you know. Um, what's the point? I mean, I've got my family, who are fabulous, my wife has been terrific. I've had to stop her coming up to this building and knocking on the door of the Director General with a letter saying how appalled she is. And how are your children? Well, it's affected, it affected my daughter very much. And it affects me, seeing how it affects the family. And that's what I hate. We must, I think, return to the yeah. vulnerable Claire McAlpine, who yes. did take her own life. Over the years, have you found yourself thinking about her? Because... She's a, it's another example for how the BBC has somehow attracted this whole yeah. nightmare. Well, I find myself thinking about that article. I mean, I personally, it's a, it's a tragic story with any child of 15, you know, uh, living in this world. But I can't hold myself responsible for it because although she might have come round and asked for an autograph or been outside Radio 1, I don't know her as a person. And you did not seduce her? Oh, God, no. No. Uh, no, of course not. No. Um, I, you know, I, I've never done a thing like that myself. I mean, I've read it in my own autobiography. I haven't led a... Uh, I've led quite an interesting life, but it's all it's there in my autobiography. And the incident with Claire McAlpine as well is in my own autobiography. Now, if I was going to try and cover anything up, would I honestly write about it in my own autobiography? The answer is no. But, you know, it's a very, very tragic story. Some people have decided to come out and back you, yeah. and they include Eamon Holmes... Uh, Danny Wallace, Piers Morgan, maybe others you're going to tell me. Is there a comeback for you from this? I'm very grateful for what they've done, and they're terrific. But um, I, I don't know, Paddy. If, you know, I probably not, because I don't think uh, BBC, the upper management, are big enough probably to say, we've, you know, this is a mess, we've made a mistake. But I think they have made a mistake. I think it's backfired on the BBC. I've got no wish to destroy the BBC. I, I love it. I think the programmes we do... Sorry, not we do anymore. We used to do. Um, great. Tony Blackburn, thank you. Thank you.